He will embrace me in His arms, in the arms of Christ my Savior. Good morning. I'd like to welcome those who are watching this TV video this morning to stay with us and be blessed by the preaching of God's Word. In 1 Corinthians, the Bible says that God chose the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Take your Bibles and open up to Exodus in chapter 20 with me, please. According to God's Word, in heaven, God has an order of things. Things are in order. It's organized. When God created the heavens and the earth, likewise, there was an order of things. God organized it. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, were cast out of the garden, and God um, <clears throat> then provided a plan for a sinful man to be able to return unto him, it was an order. It was an order of things. All the way from the Old Testament to the New, even today, and even until the Lord Jesus comes back, God has an order of things, okay? He has it organized. And so therefore, when we read God's Word, God sets things in motion. Not the preacher, not elders, not anybody else. No president, no king, other than King Jesus. He sets these things in order. And when you read the Bible from the Old Testament to the New, you find out that in God's unfolding plan, things happen just the way that God said it would. They happened at the exact time that God said it would, and even before it ever happened. When God led the children of Israel out of Egypt, He already knew the do's and don'ts, okay? And the children of Israel, God loved them. Okay? He, he loved mankind because he created them in their, his image. But they were in bondage under Pharaoh the king. And for 430 years, they learned about the gods of Egypt and forgot the God who let them out of there. So God sends Moses back in to teach them all over again the true living God. And he uses Moses and Aaron to lead his people out of bondage, out of Egypt, out into the wilderness for 40 years. And God brought them out in the wilderness to show them how he wanted them to worship him. Now it took some days because for 430 years they learned about the gods of Egypt. And so Moses had a lot of patience. There were like 600,000 men. That did not include the women and children and all the cattle and stuff. But still God had an order, an order of things. It was still organized. His plan was still unfolding just exactly the way that he wanted it. So he led the children of Israel in Egypt, and God wanted to place it where they'd all come together and honor him by way of worship. So they, first of all, they had tents. You know, we're talking at least 600,000 tents, Okay? And so God, at daytime, would lead him by a, 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 a cloud, okay? And at nighttime, he would watch over in a pillar of fire. And the next, next time they had to get up and move forward into the wilderness, they'd take up all 600,000 tents, okay? And then the, the, the holy place that was set up there temporarily. And they had to move it. The Ark of the Covenant was in there where the high priest would go in and offer up a blood sacrifice for the sins of the people. And then we got to the place where God says, we're going to stop here. Then they had to set their tents all up again, 600,000 tents. Feed their animals and set up the holy place again. And they did that for years. And finally they grasped on what God wanted from them. Okay, How to worship him the way that he wanted it. And the way God wanted it was exactly the way that he said. Okay? No other way. It was a pattern that was written down for them to worship him. Noah built the ark. 
but not without the pattern that God gave him. Okay? This ark is three football fields long, and there was a flood on the earth, went up the high, over the highest mountain, and it survived <laughs> that their catastrophe. It survived it because Noah and his family built that ark just exactly the way God said. Okay? So it is the temple that God wants, the tabernacle, the tent of the tabernacle, the children of Israel in Egypt coming out into the wilderness. Finally, God says, they're starting to finally learn how to worship me the way that I want them to, according just as I have said. And then they built a tabernacle, okay? And it was temporary. And in that tabernacle, God used Moses and Aaron to set up the order of things, okay? There would be a high priest, and then there would be a priest, okay? And then there would be other people who would come in with different kinds of instruments and play those instruments. Then there would be a song leader singing, helping everybody get in organization as they sing and praise God. There was a treasurer, okay? But they did it just according to the way God said. There are many people in the world today, as it was then, that they set their, up their own tabernacles, okay? They made their own priests. They did their things their own way because it was convenient the way that they wanted it. And I can understand that because the high priest back in the, that day had to kill animals and make that animal sacrifice for every family. The head of every family, there were 600,000 men. So if you had the job of killing 600,000 animals, wouldn't you want to eat one easier way? Yeah. You know, the Bible says, and second, second uh, dairy history says that <clears throat> the blood from those animals is like rain wall running down the gutters. There was that much blood. That's quite a job. And no wonder they wanted it easier. But that's not what God wanted for them. He wanted them to worship him the way that he said. And so they offered up their animal sacrifice because it was for them, okay? It was for them to learn obedience. Obedience to God is the key. And so God sent Moses in. Moses, after God put ten plagues upon Egypt, Pharaoh was glad to get rid of them. Sent them out in the wilderness and they set things up the way God instructed them. Now God talked to Moses, okay, the prophet. And then Moses went and uh, talked to the people about it, instructed the people what God had said. So this is well as when Moses went up on the mountain to get the Ten Commandments. God, with his own finger, wrote the Ten Commandments on tablets of stone. And then Moses go down off the mountain and read what God had said to him, Okay. And then God expected the children of Israel to obey everything that he said. He expected it. And if they didn't, that was sin. That's, that's what sin is. Sin is just uh, getting drunk or doing drugs or being a, a whore or uh, being a thief or being a murderer. That's not just what sin is. Sin in a nutshell is disobeying God. That's what sin is. And so, uh, that's why those Ten Commandments were written, so that they'd understand what displeased God, what sin was. So they had knowledge of it. And so Moses did so. Now in Exodus chapter 20, and I'd like to start with verse 18. <clears throat> okay, God already talked about the Ten Commandments there. The first part of the Ten Commandments was to God. Okay? The first five. The next five was to people. Okay, how we deal with people. And in verse 18, And all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed and stood far off. It scared them. That mountain was on fire. Great thunderings and lightnings. It was smoking. And it scared them. You know, the Bible says man can't look upon God and live. Well, that was the next thing to God, seeing all that stuff, and it scared him. 
Verse 19, And they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God has come to prove you, and that his fear may be before your faces, that ye sin not. And the people stood afar off, and Moses drew near unto the thick darkness where God was. And the Lord said to Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, Ye have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. Ye shall not make with me gods of silver, neither shall ye make unto you gods of gold. An altar of earth thou shalt make unto me, and shalt sacrifice thereon thy burnt offerings, and thy peace offerings, thy sheep and thy oxen, in all places where I record my name. I will come unto thee, and I will bless thee. And if thou wilt make me an altar of stone, thou shalt not build it with of hewn stone. For if thou lift up thy tool upon it, thou hast polluted it. Neither shalt thou go up by steps unto my altar, that thy nakedness be not discovered thereon. <clears throat> Do you see how God said to make the altar out of stones? But, but don't do no cutting or engraving on it. Okay? That's what he said. And so, in order for the children of Israel to be pleasing to God, they had to do it just exactly as he said. The pattern that he gave them. Okay? Now, if you take your Bibles, go to Hebrews in chapter 8 with me, please. God's plan always, always re, um, <clears throat> needed order. The Samaritans at one time, they chose a different hill, Mount Gerson. The Jews, and it was true that Jesus died at Calvary, Mount Calvary, in Jerusalem outside the city walls. But the Samaritans said that Jesus died on Mount uh, Garrison and that the temple that we were, were to go worship was in Mount Garrison. And um, Jesus told her the truth and corrected her on that and <clears throat> told her that God had an order of things. His plan was unfolding and we must follow it. Jesus said in John chapter 4 that... <clears throat> Those that worship me must worship me in spirit and in truth. Because God seeks those who will worship him that way. Do you see, do you see in that it's saying what God wants? Okay? It doesn't say what we want or what the preacher wants or anything by wants. It's saying what God wants. God is the supplier. He's the redeemer. God can give us life or take it. He provides. God is the one who we're going to stand before one day when all things else is said and done. So he wants us to worship him in spirit and in truth. To do it any other way would be disobedience to God, would be sin. Just like he told Moses and the children of Israel. Now in verse 1 of chapter 8 of Hebrews. Now the things which we have spoken, this is the Son. We have such an high priest, speaking of Jesus, he is our high priest in heaven, who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary, and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched, and not man. You see how they address God? The majesty in the heavens. You know what? You hear how people address God sometimes here on this earth? The old man upstairs or whatever the case may be. You don't find that in the Bible. Because he's not that. He is majestic. The majesty in the heavens. And that's how every Christian ought to address God. Look upon God the Father. as the majesty in heavens. Um, it goes on to say that... Um, the, man, the minister of the sanctuary, the true tabernacle, was the Lord pitched, not man. The true tabernacle is the one that the Lord pitched, the Lord built. Okay, Jesus said in Matthew 16, uh, starting with uh, verse uh, 18, Upon this rock I will build my church. That's what Jesus said. 
said he will build it. And so, not man. The preacher doesn't build the church. The elders don't build the church. No king or president builds the church. No one builds the church except for Jesus. Okay? So, the tab true tabernacle is the one that the Lord pitched and not man. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. So when you uh, read the Old Testament, the Levites is who, the people whom God chose to be priests and high priests, the Levites. Okay? No others could be. Or they'd die. Okay? They couldn't go serve in the tabernacle. That was their only job, by the way. Every Levite, <clears throat> the Levites... The priesthood is made up of Levites, but not every Levite was a priest, okay? Now, God has specific order of things, the job that they had to do. They go into the, the tabernacle, the true tabernacle, set up the showbread, the Lord's Supper, okay? Uh, the candles for prayer, uh, the Holy of Holies, where the cherubims are, where the Ark of the Covenant is, and there's where the high priest would go in and offer up a blood sacrifice and wipe it up the blood on the, the mercy seat there to make atonement for the sins of the children of Israel. And it had to be done that order. Only the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies. The priest couldn't. There was, the priest set up the showbread and the candlesticks and the laven and all the other stuff. That was their job. And they were to perform it every day. They were not to go out and raise corn and beef and work in a factory or something. They had families to take care of. But their job only was to serve in the tabernacle. And that's where we get the tithe. Out of all the children of Israel, the Levites did not have an inheritance. The other children of Israel did. They had all the land, all the cattle and stuff, and they could provide for their families. But the Levites had to serve in the tabernacle by the command of God and not go do all these other jobs, the secondary jobs. How did they take care of their family? God said, I'll take a tenth, a tithe from the children of Israel, and it becomes mine, God said. It becomes holy. And in return, he would give it to the Levites, the priests, and the high priests that served in the tabernacle. That would be theirs, okay? Their paycheck, if you will. Now, no one else could do this. If they weren't a Levites and one that was qualified, they could not approach the tabernacle and serve in any manner like that, or they would die. They'd be killed. So it is today in the Lord's church. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit, okay? It's not a physical building. Not this building. This building will burn one of these days. But it's you and I that's been baptized in Jesus Christ. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit, okay? Then he went on to say in verse 3, For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. Wherefore, it is of necessity that this man, speaking of Jesus, has somewhat also to offer. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest. Because Jesus was not a Levite. Okay? He couldn't be a priest on this earth. He'd be breaking the law if he did. But he's a high priest in heaven. Okay? <clears throat> For if he were on earth... He should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law. And it's talking about the Old Testament priests. Okay? It's not talking about the priests in the Catholic Church. By the way, both male and female in the church is a priest. Okay? It has nothing to do with men. Both male and female in the church is priest. And we're going to see that here in a little bit. Who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things. In other words, in the Old Testament, the tabernacle that God set up, the pattern that he set up, was not the real, not the perfect thing. It was just a shadow that when Jesus came on the scene, the perfect would be seen. 
be a servant to the example uh, in the shadow of heavenly things as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For, see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed thee in the mount. Okay? He was commanded to make all things according to the pattern showed him in the mount. And so he instructed the children of Israel to build the tabernacle just exactly as God said. And they performed their services in the tabernacle just the way God said it, or else they would die. It would be sin. 1 Peter chapter 2. Okay, we need to pick up on this as Christians. In verse 9, the Apostle Peter, who spent three and a half years with Jesus, all the time that he went in and out among them until the day that he was taken up from them, you see. Peter was among the men who were baptized in the Holy Spirit. He could lay his hands on people, give them gifts, okay, speak in tongues, heal the sick, whatever. This man said these words. He's talking to the church, every Christian, both male and female. But you are a chosen generation. Okay, not the Jews that were born physically Jews. He's not talking about them. He's talking about you and me. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. All the Christians make up a royal priesthood, both men and women. And holy nation. Okay, Jerusalem's not the holy nation. Israel's not the holy nation anymore. The church is. We're a holy nation. We live in two nations, by the way. The church makes up the holy nation of Israel, and we live in the nation of the United States of America. Okay? And it goes on to say, a peculiar people. When the world looks at you and me, it says we're peculiar. That means we're different. Okay? We're different. That's what when people look at the Christian, the church today, they should see Jesus in us and not what we were. Okay? A peculiar people, and the reason is, this is the reason, that ye should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. <laughs> you know, um, Forty-some years ago, I was caught out of darkness or out of wickedness, evil, into his marvelous light because I repented of my sins and was baptized into Jesus Christ. And that's what he did for me. And now I'm a kingdom person, and so are you if you're baptized in Christ. You're a kingdom person. This world's not our home. We're just passing through. Our home is with Jesus Christ when we get there. We should show forth the praises of him that has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. No one else could do that. Okay, we couldn't do it for ourselves. We've been called out of a uh, life of sin into a life of righteousness. Okay, by Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 1. We just read these things a while ago. Revelation chapter 1, verse 5. <clears throat> and from Jesus Christ, or that ought to be Jesus the Christ, okay? Uh, that's not his last name. Jesus Christ, Christ is not his last name. Same way as John the Baptist. Baptist is not his last name. They didn't have last names, or it's not recorded. That's something he was doing. That's why it says John the Baptist. This should be Jesus the Christ. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. We've been made a kingdom of priests. 
Joanne and Debbie and Bonnie and Robert and Bill and Nene. We've been made a kingdom of priests. All of us. We're a royal priesthood in the eyes of the Lord. That's why we have a right <laughs> to this supper. Okay? And we should act like kingdom people. We should not let the world get us down. We should not let the devil get us down to a place where we're, we don't uh, think of ourselves as priests. We are. You go into the Catholic Church and the priests are put up on a pedestal. Okay, sometimes you kiss their ring finger, you know. Hopefully you don't kiss the diamond they have on their, their finger. Some, they call them fathers. You can go into this, this dark room and they're on the other side and you open up this little door and confess your sins to him and he forgives you. That's nowhere in the Bible. That's just absolutely false teaching. It comes straight from the devil. You and I, both men and women in the church, be baptized in Jesus Christ, you're a priest. We're of a royal priesthood, okay? You can go over to England, the queen and the king over there, and they're below you, you see. We're of a royal priesthood. We have a king that is the king of kings, okay? King of kings. going somewhere and I forgot where, where it was. Okay, let's go to 1 John 1, 9. Starting in verse 1. <clears throat> From the book of Romans, okay, to the book of Revelation. Every Christian needs to and ought to know this. There are letters to the Christian only, to the church only, okay? It's not letters to people who aren't Christians, okay? It's not for them. It's for you and me as the church. So what we're reading here is for the Christian. First John, starting with verse 1. First John chapter 1, starting with verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, our hands have handled of the word of life. And that's the apostles speaking. And what did they handle? The word of life It's talking about Jesus. For the life was manifest or made known, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father, and was manifest or made known unto us. That which we have seen and heard, Declare we unto you, and are doing it through the word like you and I are reading it this morning. That ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. When the church comes together, where we might be in this world today, on Sunday, the first day of the week, to observe the Lord's Supper, we're communing with Jesus. Matthew chapter 26, the Bible says, I think it is, Verse 29, that Jesus made a promise that he would not partake of this again, talking to the apostles before he died, until he drank it new with us in his Father's kingdom. The kingdom was not established yet when Jesus was alive on the earth, okay? It's when he died and went back to heaven, then it was started. And the kingdom is the church, okay? The church is worldwide, but it's only one church, by the way. It's only one church. And um, their fellowship was with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. And they are saying that you and I can have that same kind of fellowship with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. That's what God wants it. That's the pattern that He has set forth. <clears throat> and these things write me into you that your joy may be full. You see, they were considerate. You know, we're just them having great joy. But he wanted us to have great joy too. You see, the apostles did. <clears throat> this then is the message which we have heard of him, speaking of Jesus, and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. The darkness could not comprehend the light of Jesus, okay? 
There is no darkness in God. It's always light. In heaven, there'll never be any darkness. You won't have no need of the, sun, the, moon, the moon, the stars, and the sun because the light of Jesus Christ, the glory of God, will lighten heaven. And it will be that at all times. Okay? There'll be no darkness there. There will be no sin or corruption enter into this, here, this spiritual kingdom. Okay? There'll be no more death, no more crying, no more, no more pain. You see. He went on to say, If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, and how we do that? By the studying of God's word. By having prayer communion with our Lord and obeying what we have read. Okay? The pattern that he set forth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. See what that says? We're to have fellowship one with another. Not just on Sunday, but with one another as much as we can. Now, I know it's hard sometimes, but the early church did it, and it was important because we're the family of God. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and when that's happening, when we walk in the light, having fellowship one with another, it says, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Well, I thought my sin was washed away when I was baptized. They were. But you know what? We as Christians, because we're in this body, we're in this world, we still sin sometimes, okay? We just don't go out and practice it habitually. But we do fall short of God's glory. Satan catches us in traps sometimes. Some we just, sometimes we decide to sin. And the Bible says that his blood continues to cleanse us from our sins. Okay, so that should do away with the guilt. Any guilt of sin, God washes it away through his son Jesus Christ, okay? So we must accept that and stand on that. Don't let sin get us down or the guilt of sin. It says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and truth is not in us. It's talking to Christians. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So any Christian dare not say that you have not sinned even as a Christian because you make God a liar. But you see, we, when we're baptized, and I'm going to close, we're baptized into Christ, we're clothed with a white robe of righteousness. Okay? We are. Jesus gives that to us. And that white robe of righteousness gets stained once in a while. It's like all of us. Probably tomorrow, next day, we'll, we'll wash our clothes, okay? Because they've gotten a little dirty. And we should. So it is our white robe of righteousness. It gets dirty once in a while. And needs to be cleaned up. And so when we confess our sins to him, Jesus says that he's just and he's faithful to forgive us of those sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's good news for the Christian. This morning, if you're not a Christian, the Bible says you need to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. By believing that message, one repents of their sins. Repentance is a change of mind and conduct toward the way that you're living and you turn towards God. The Bible says one must be baptized by immersion to have your sins washed away and to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Not to help you speak and tell them to do miracles like some teach, but to help you live a faithful life unto Jesus and his word unto the end. If you're all Christian this morning and you're not uh, keeping on that pattern that set forth in God's word, well, that's sin, friend. Sin will separate us from God, will separate us from God for all eternity if we let it. And you must repent. Repentance is not a bad word. It's just an avenue that God gives his people to come back to him. First John 1, 9 again. If we confess our sins to him, speaking of Jesus, 
He's just and faithful to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness.